After buying and freeing Raftalia from the slave trader and nursing her back to health, Steve took his time when it came to developing the young girl's skills and abilities. Of course, he had no intentions on forcing her to fight if she didn't want to. After all, she was only a child, but because he had been getting used to using status magic, he was able to see that the girl had capability, but whether or not she wanted to use those capabilities, that was entirely on her. If she wanted to live a normal life, then Steve would find the best place to drop her off and would be on his way. But much to his surprise, the girl chose to stay with him. He was surprisingly kind and warm, and when she discovered that he was a shield hero, and she thought about the stories that she had heard from her parents long ago, she couldn't help but feel reminiscent of that hero. Steve embodied all the qualities of the shield hero, of the shield hero of legend, so much so to the point where she almost thought that she was dreaming. Unlike in the original story, where the original shield hero, Naofumi, would be more standoffish and cold to Raftalia, Steve was kind, warm, empathetic, sweet, and caring. As such, the relationship between the two was fostered a lot more quickly. Steve was the perfect person to train Raftalia. He had the skills and the capabilities of a soldier. As such, raising her up and leveling her up was a lot easier than one might expect. There were no real growing pains in terms of the two getting comfortable with one another. It was more so in the fact that Steve just paced himself, making sure that he didn't overwork the girl in any way or push her beyond her limits. And in the meantime, Steve continued to grow in his own right as he gained more shields and abilities. Outside of the basic shield, the leaf shield and the rope shield, he also gained the airstrike shield and the Cerberus shield, a shield that took the form of three-headed dogs that could lunge out and attack at will. On top of that, as they continued growing stronger and working together, Raftalia became a lot more skilled in her own right. Remember, in the original story, Raftalia's skills grew slowly with Nalfami, as the two of them were still trying to grow in their own right. But now, Raftalia starts off with a much better teacher in this event, because she's training with THE Captain America, a man skilled in multiple forms of combat, martial arts, espionage, and other skills needed of a true soldier. As such, Raftalia would be far more stronger, ruthless, cunning, and a lot more about her wits, making her far more dangerous of a demi-human. As such, Steve not only gained a valuable partner, but also someone who could, he could train with, someone who could actually push him and make him improve his game. It was when they were back in the village, when they were making their way towards the blacksmith of the kingdom, Erhard, where he would tell them about the church, where the dragon hourglass lied, that would tell them about the next wave of catastrophe. Of course, Steve and Raftalia would go to it, and upon learning when the next wave was set to come, they weren't surprised to run into the others, Motoyatsu and Princess Mine. Of course, Motoyatsu already had his preconceived notions. You see, as a reminder, he came from the world where Steve Rogers, aka Captain America, died during the events of the original Marvel Civil War. Now, while the death was tragic, it was still used in forms of propaganda in a way. In that world, Steve was portrayed to be a crazed egomaniac, someone who was out of date, who couldn't get with the times, and couldn't learn to adapt and evolve. As such, while not everyone held that view of him, that was a preconceived notion that was seeping into the minds of some. Many thought that Steve was an outdated relic of the past, something that just needed to be stored away and kept in the history books. So for Motoyasu, it was easy to believe that Steve could just be some depraved human being with no real soul or care, 
because in the end, what would he expect? Or, long story short, he just thought Steve was a bigoted fool who had to be put down. Of course, there were those who had other preconceived notions as well. When it came to Ren, Steve, or Captain America in this instance, was little more than just an ancient fairy tale. Something that, sure, probably existed, but in the end, wasn't anything too great of note. He had seen and experienced far more, far more better, far more cooler than a guy with a shield. Itsuki had the most insight when it came to Captain America, primarily because in his universe, Steve Rogers actually did become the president for a short time of the United States. You could say that he was more polarizing than anything else. Definitely a good leader, but still he could have his moments, and you were never too sure how you felt about him. In the end, everyone had their ideal versions of what Captain America was, and it wasn't for the best. It was always the same conceived ideas. A hero that fell from grace who was good for his time, but outlived it tremendously. Like an old dog that needed to be put down, or food that far exceeded the expiration date. He was old fashioned. He just wasn't it. Not what this world truly needed. And the boys tried to make him feel that way every chance they got, especially Motoyasu. Princess Mine, of course, loved stirring the pot, and Steve saw this. Unlike the original S.H.I.E.L.D. hero, Steve was able to read through mine pretty quickly. It was obvious based on her attitude and notions that she was the type of person who loved to put up a front, pretending to be something that they clearly weren't. Did she have a deep-seated hatred for just a S.H.I.E.L.D. hero or him in particular? And, judging on how the King treated him, was it something that was taught from birth? If so, all he could be felt with was pity. This poor girl was raised by an egotistical fool, and now as such, she developed little in terms of good social quality and standing. While the other three heroes would berate Steve every chance they got, calling him old, washed, useless, Steve simply chose to ignore all of them. Truthfully, it didn't matter. If what they said were true, he didn't come or share the same world as any of them, which was honestly for the best. It didn't mean that Steve would stop or change who he was, no. If he ever came across any of them in their time of need, he'd help them. That was just the type of person he was. It was true that in the beginning, it was a shell shock to go from one dire situation to another and then to another. It was almost more than any man could take. And to a degree, the boys were right. Even when he was in the army, there was always this idea that Steve was a goody two-shoes, that he didn't have any problems in the world, that there was just no darkness in his heart. If they thought that way, they were very wrong. There was a lot of anger, resentment, sometimes hatred. Steve was human, like anyone else, flawed. He was blue, but there was always a tinge of green. That imperfection. Everyone thought that he was the perfect man, the perfect soldier, the perfect this, the perfect that. But there was no such thing as perfect with him. He didn't live a perfect life. He lived a hard one. He lived a life as hard as anyone else around. It was just that he had perspective on things. He always had the hope that things could get better. And even in spite of everything he had lost, that hope was still with him. He was going to protect this world. It was what he knew he had to do. It was the only way he could get back home, so it's not like he had a choice. But even still, even if everything changed around him, even if the world decided to throw away their morals, even if everything decided to decay into corruption, Steve chose not to be that way. Because if there was one thing he had always learned. It was that he could only control his actions. He was the one that was responsible for that. It didn't matter what anyone else did or what they said, how he responded, that was his choice and his choice alone. He could either choose to be cynical, to allow himself to fall into despair, or he could rise above it. 
and accept everything that came with that. It was one of the many traits that Raftalia had admired about her master. Seeing how he took everything in stride, it was an endearing quality. The wave would begin and the heroes along with their party members would be transported. Of course, the three heroes chose to band together, looking to leave Steve in the dust, but off in the distance, they saw that there was a village, Loot Village to be specific. It was being unprotected, the other three heroes not giving it any mind. There were monsters beginning to run rampant and the villagers were being attacked. Without hesitation, Steve and Raftalia would jump into battle, the two of them working together perfectly in sync. The people of the village would be in awe as the shield hero and his fellow sword, Raftalia, got to work. The two of them didn't even need to communicate. Steve on the defense, Raftalia on the attack. Steve using his shields in creative ways to protect the villagers and fight the monsters, while Raftalia was ruthless, cutting down each one that came before them. Of course, by the time a band of soldiers had arrived, they just started shooting willy-nilly without any care for the civilians or anyone else. It made Raftalia sick, and for Steve, he felt the same. The job of a soldier was to protect the people, to protect the innocent. These guys clearly weren't doing that, nor did they care. At least, the commander didn't. And, when he felt like he wasn't getting the respect he was owed, especially from a lowly shield, he decided to just go and join up with the other heroes. Some of his soldiers left with him, but some of them stayed. Some willing to fight alongside the shield hero of all people. And for that, Steve was grateful. He was able to coordinate with the soldiers, putting them in the best positions to help and to defend. They were in awe of his leadership. How he was able to coordinate so quickly? He definitely knew what he was doing more so than the others, who just seemed to fight and do whatever came to mind. Sure, they got the job done, but it didn't tell of the full story. For all the good that the other three heroes did, they only caused more problems when they fought. They never took into account the civilian casualties or the collateral damage. It was just fight the monsters, win, get their rewards and their praise. They pranced around acting like they were heroes, but really they were just spoiled entitled brats who had no real care or guidance or anything. They treated it all like a game and some of them referred to it as such, but to Steve this was very much real. Whether it was an illusion or something else, it didn't matter. He wasn't going to take that risk, but it was obvious that his fellow counterparts didn't feel the same. In the end, the wave was beat back and the catastrophe was brought to its end. The villagers from Loot Village were grateful to Steve and Raftalia and the soldiers who stayed and fight on their behalf. They were grateful for their heroes. And Steve in kind, he was just grateful that they gave him a chance. A banquet would be held at the castle in Melramark and King Alcray would be overseeing the affair. Steve, of course, didn't really want to be here, but in the end, it was good for Raftalia to get some quality food, because it wasn't like they could get it often. Plus, he had learned they were going to be getting a reward. It wasn't like it was the best of circumstances, but Steve decided to roll with the punches. There was good food, there was going to be a reward, and they could get out of there quickly. So you might as well take the good with the bad. Even if the people were murmuring around him, talking about him behind his back, talking about the false charges that had been brought on his name over and over again, Steve simply ignored it all. However, Princess Mine, always looking to stir up some controversy, decided to spill the beans to Motoyasu that Steve had actually bought the demi-human girl and that she was a slave. Of course, Motoyasu, wanting to act all macho and show his bravado, would throw down his glove towards Steve, challenging him to a duel, stating that it wasn't right for the heroes to own slaves, although Steve would retort that he merely brought Raftalia's freedom, and that she chose to fight with him out of her own free will. 
She wasn't a slave. She didn't have a slave crest. He wasn't going to force anything onto her. But of course, Motoyasu didn't listen. And the others, wanting to piggyback and look cool and self-righteous, followed suit. If they were just going to cause a commotion, Steve could just leave. He had no reason to stay here. He and Raftalia were preparing to when the king would have his soldiers seize Raftalia. Steve was preparing to punch them all in the face, but the king forced him to duel against Motoyasu. Motoyasu, deciding that if he won, Raftalia would join his party. Besides, it wasn't like she had to be with the likes of him anyway. He was just a decrepit old man who had old perverse ways. And who knows, perhaps he was just trying to trick her, trying to get one over so that she could lower her guard and he could do whatever he wanted, just like he did with Princess Mai, who gave him a chance. It was when he said that, though, that is what pissed him off. You really don't know anything, do you, kid? I know enough, disgrace of the shield. I know enough to know that no sane girl would ever join you willingly. It's obvious, even if you did buy her freedom, you did it with your own malice intent. I see through your lies. You may try to have everyone else fooled, acting like you're a good-hearted person. But I know the truth. The truth about who and what you really are. You're a decrepit old man stuck in his ways. A man who can't change. It's time for you to catch up on the times. You're not the big fish around here. We've all grown stronger in our own right. We've all leveled up. All that little cutesy soldier crap that you learned back in the day... It doesn't mean a damn around here. Is that so? Moriyasu, I pity you. You what? You pity me? I see a lot of potential in all of you. And yet you choose to waste it. You squander it. You play around pretending to be something that you're not. But where I come from, it's only so long the fake soldiers can pretend. You think you're so much better than me? Fine. I didn't come here to show off. I don't really care to brag. You're free to do whatever you want. But when you mess with the people I care about, that's something I can't look away from. I'll fight you. And I don't even want anything. I don't want a reward, I don't want praise, I don't want anything at all. I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to teach you. Because it's obvious that none of your parents taught you very much. What was that? So now you want to bring my parents into it, Motoyasu would say. You smug, shield-wielding bastard. Who in the hell do you think you are? You're a nobody, a loser. Last time I checked, your parents died before you even joined the army, you scrawny runt. There's nothing special about you. We all know. If there's one thing that we know about Captain America is that he's famed for taking that damn soldier serum. The first super soldier, the first hero. You're the first nothing. You're a lab experiment. Everything that's special about you came out of a bottle. <laughs> I don't disagree with you. You're right. Anyone could have taken that serum and gotten my power. Anyone could have done it. So, you're not wrong. But, unfortunately for you, I'm the guy that took it. And unfortunately for you, you have to fight that guy. Well, I wouldn't call it much of a fight. Again, this is a learning experience. I'm going to help you. Because I'm good like that. The duel would be set between Motoyasu, the spear hero, and Steve Rogers, the shield hero. As the fight would begin, Motoyasu would go on the offense. Steve dodging and blocking with ease. 
Motoyasu continued to strike with every new spear he could come up with, but Steve was able to evade and counter strike. Come on now, Spear Hero. I thought you could do better than that. What have you been doing for this past month? You been slacking off? Urgh. Stand still, you! Oh, what's the matter? Working hard or hardly working? <laughs> if I tag you, you won't be so smug. Come on, kid. You're looking like you're out of breath. I can do this all day. Steve would continue to taunt Mother Yasu as he kept going. The people in the crowd were starting to become a bit dejected. It looked like the shield hero could actually win. Even Princess Mine tried to get involved using magic from the crowd, attempting to give Motoyasu the edge. Even though Steve was tripped up for a moment, he just turned it into his advantage. Using the rope shield, he tied it around his legs and pulled him down, before jumping into the air and delivering a devastating elbow to the gut. Motoyasu even dropped his spear. As he ran towards it, Steve would step on it, looking down at him. <clears throat> Let go! Pick it up. What? I said pick it up. I'm trying, but you're standing! I said, pick it up. Steve kicked Motoyasu in the face. Go on, pick up your spear. Motoyasu ran towards it. Steve grabbed him by the collar and threw him back against the wall. I gave you an order, son. I said, pick the spear up. He ran towards it again, only to get tripped up and thrown back against the wall. Are you going to do as I say or what? I'm not listening to you. You're going to pick up the spear. Not because you tell me. I'm telling you to pick it up. He tried to pick it up again, only to get dropped. No wonder why your parents don't like you. You have a hard time following orders, soldier. I've told you to pick up this spear multiple times, and yet you still can't do it. You want to know why you can't do it? Because you can't get past me. And let this be a lesson for all of you. You're going to run into people in this world who aren't as kind and as generous as I am. They won't be kind enough to tell you to pick up your weapon. They won't be kind enough to tell you whether you're going to live or die. You make one false move and you're dead. And one last thing, Motoyasu. Catch! Using his feet, Steve would kick the spear to Motoyasu, who caught it with both hands, and his face was free for a sucker punch that quickly followed, knocking him clean out. The king would call for the match over, and unfortunately, the shield hero would be given the win. Steve would look to the king and just demand his reward so he could get out of here, the king snarking as he only gave him 500 silver. Not like the other payments he planned to give everyone else. It was the lowest. Steve just took the reward and left in stride. He gathered Raftalia and as they prepared to walk away, in a fit of anger, Motoyasu would pick his spear and throw it right at Steve. Only the trajectory was off because his vision was still wobbly from the punch. It was going to be aiming right at Raftalia. In anger, Steve grabbed hold of the spear, his hand crackling with lightning as he wasn't supposed to be holding another person's weapon. But still, he gritted through the pain and threw the spear right back at Motoyasu, pinning it to the wall right beside his head. The others couldn't believe it. How was he able to do that? Itsuki would say. He picked up someone else's cardinal weapon and used it. It made Ren begin to shudder. How foolish had they been? It didn't matter what they thought of him. This was still Captain America. And they... They were underestimating him. 
Steve glared at all of the Cardinal heroes before walking out with Raftalia. The two of them were going to leave. It was time for them to move on anyway. Before leaving, though, they would stop to the magic shop where a kind older woman gave a gift to Steve. It was a grimoire. It contained a lot of different spells and other sorts of remedies and other abilities that he might be capable of using. It was a thank you for saving her granddaughter. They had lived in Loot Village, and it was thanks to his efforts that her family survived. Of course, Steve had no way of knowing that that could possibly have been the case, but still, he was thankful for the kind gesture. Although, unfortunately, he had no idea of knowing how to read it. Thankfully, that's where Raftalia could help him out, and the two of them would learn to read it together. As they were preparing to leave, though, there was a cart passing them by. Raftalia shuddered. It was a slave cart. Of course, Steve wasn't too fond of the slave trader, but for now, there wasn't anything he could do about it. But, almost as if it were by fate, something fell from the cart. Raftalia managed to catch it and stow it away before anyone could see. As they quickly got to the outside walls of the village and headed to the countryside, she would show it to him. It was a filolial egg. The filolial birds, the large birds that were often seen carrying carriages and other sorts of wagons and things. Of course, Steve was captivated by it, but he wondered what they were supposed to do with it. Raftalia told him that if they took care of it and raised it, they could have a filolial of their own that could work with them or help them. Of course, Steve didn't mind that. It would be akin to raising a pet bird or something like that. He only hoped that he could take care of it properly. But for now, the two of them would rest and make camp for the night. Tomorrow would have its own sorts of challenges and adversities and other uncertainties. But no matter what, at least for Steve and Raftalia, they knew that no matter what came their way, they could get through it as long as they stuck together. This concludes The Rising of the Shield Hero, The Man Out of Time, What If Captain America Was the Shield Hero, Season 1, Part 2. As always, if you enjoyed today's video and everything else that we have to offer, then please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and hit that bell for post notifications so you can stay up to date on everything that is Power Core Productions and Podcastings that has to come out now and in the future. Also, if you haven't, make sure you check out yesterday's afternoon video as in the evenings, we are going to be doing Demon Slayer, Dark Fury, What If Tondro Had Venom, Season 3, and yesterday we started with Season 3, Part 1. And stay tuned tomorrow morning as we will be continuing with What If Captain America Was the Shield Hero, Season 1, Part 3. But anyway, that's going to do it for the end of today's video. I'm Javon Harrington with Power Core Productions and Podcastings. Signing off, and I'll see you next time.